Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are talking to Autonomous, which is one of the leading crypto legal plays in our space. It's a company that allows one to make a digital representation of a company's uh, constitution. Specifically, we'll be talking to Mano Thanabalan, who is the CTO there. Mano, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me, guys. So before we start talking about Autonomous and what uh, that project is doing, tell us a bit about your background and how you came to be involved in the blockchain space. Sure. Um, maybe I'll start from the, the very start. Uh, I've got a computer science bachelor's. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't go down the route of a typical software engineer. Instead, I went to the dark side and worked for a major uh, car manufacturer in the corporate treasury department. And there I did uh, financial risk management, FX risk, interest rate risk, and so on. After that, I did my financial engineering master's. Uh, that's when I sort of decided that I'm going to move on from the risk management world to the investment finance world, if you would. Um, and quickly realized that the investment finance world was, was as well um, as everybody sees it today, not the place you want to be. Uh, was a quant trader for a small hedge fund in Singapore that unfortunately closed down. Uh, we didn't even get to launch the, the quant fund. Um, and then when I came out of that, I was looking for, so I had, I had researched a bunch of quant models, trading strategies. Um, and I came out of there thinking, okay, I'm just going to start my own fund or implement my own strategies for, for personal use, right? Uh, I had to build a trading system. I built that trading system, took time off to build that trading system, uh, then realized I needed to test the trading system. And that's sort of when I came across Bitcoin exchanges. I was like, okay, this would be an easy way to test my trading system. Started interfacing uh, with a bunch of these exchanges, running some of my complex strategies, which were a little bit too complex for, for these exchanges because uh, they're not that mature yet. Um, and then quickly realized you could just run simple arbitrage strategy, strategies on these exchanges and make some money. Uh, did that, and that's sort of when uh, my interest uh, peaked on the topic. And I was like researching and I found out, oh, I was actually introduced to Bitcoin even a year or two years before that by a friend from college. But unfortunately, I didn't take him seriously at that time. I kind of regretted it now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I started researching into, into uh, the, the technology. And um, that was also when sort of Ethereum was being uh, spoken about. So it's very interesting what's happening in the space. I worked for um, the ex-CEO of Ethereum for a bit, uh, helping him out with the project. and. That was again before Ethereum was launched. Um, and yeah, uh, worked there for about two months. And then I was looking for opportunities in the space. Uh, unfortunately, every opportunity I came across was either a payments or a remittance play, which was not where I saw the best use case for blockchain technology, if you would, or smart contracts in, uh, uh, on top of that. Um, but I came across Han uh, on AngelList. And I really, I was not a co-founder from day one. I, Applied to him saying that I'll be very interested in the I'm very interested in the use case. I'll really help want to help you out and see if we can figure out something. Um, he was also looking for somebody to build a platform. Um, so that's basically how we met. Uh, this was 2015 October. Uh, before you knew it, three months later, we had a very early POC, um, and we already had people who heard about what we were doing, wanting to use our service. So that's when we came to the realization that the POC could become a viable business plan or model. So um, that's basically my background and how I joined Autonomous. Cool. Uh, so you mentioned that you were a trader before, uh, and that's interesting. And I think we'll, we'll get to talk a little bit about your experience there and you know, sort of um, you know, the, the financial system and how we can, rev you know, we, how we can digitize some of the processes and the sort of traditional financial system with smart contracts. But I'm interested in, in, in knowing, you know, with regards to your experience as a trader, uh, what has that, you know, what, what lessons have you learned there that have ported over now to what you're doing uh, at Autonomous? So there's several parts of it. Um, first is uh, the main reason I find the Autonomous use case very interesting was also because I was involved in the setup of the fund that I was working for before. 
so I mentioned that we didn't get the launch, but we still had set up the fund. Uh, and that process, uh, setting up a fund process in Cayman Islands is a 50,000 US dollar process. Very laborious, takes you three months to generate a very standard set of documents uh, before you can start approaching investors to invest in your company, right? So I already knew the friction behind what it meant to, in this case, it was a hedge fund, which is just a special type of a private limited company, um, what friction there existed to set up a company in the real world. Um, and the other thing, that, that helps me a lot uh, at Autonomous is also the fact that bridging theory and, practic uh, and practical implementation is, was a big challenge um, when I was building my trading strategies. You could backtest your quantitative models all you want and they will show you amazing results. But when you actually try to implement some of these uh, results and run them in a managed account as we did, then you start figuring out that, hey, uh, markets don't work like how your backtests work. Um, and why this was relevant for the autonomous platform was because when we built the platform, the initial idea was, um, yes, let's represent private limited company shares um, using a suite of smart contracts. Uh, but hang on, this also has to be bridged to the real world, right? Because if you say that these tokens represent private limited company shares, um, how do you prove this in the real world? So you actually have to build a bridge between theory and implementation. Um, and that is sort of how we... Uh, approach anything that we do at Autonomous is basically to look at it from a theoretical point of view, do all our research from a theoretical point of view, and then in the implementation phase, figure out how we can make this work with existing processes without trying to go to people, telling them that they need to change existing processes just yet. So uh, tell us, like, give us an overview of Autonomous. What problem is it trying to solve? The big problem it's trying to solve is the fact that if you need to incorporate a company today, if you want to govern a company today, you still can't even do that like you would check out, as Han would like to say, a pizza. You still can't electronically check out a company, especially in common law jurisdictions like Singapore, Hong Kong, mm. where we operate. Um, so that's the first step. And Han, uh, credit to him, he did an amazing job in the early days. He's not a developer like me. Uh, he used Wix to just generate a website that will allow you to check out such a company and then process the order. So that itself was the innovative part, right? Um, and then this, the second aspect was, okay, great that we are able to check these companies out, but we also need to provide a platform for them to manage this company. So mm -hmm. essentially, we are a corporate actions, corporate governance play on blockchain. Um, and that forms the fundamental basis for a whole bunch of other features, like accounting, like uh, doing a funding round, um, that Sebastian and I discussed earlier. Um, and if you look at all these traditional uh, process flows and how cumbersome and laborious they are, uh, the autonomous platform in one word is essentially of these processes, uh, specifically uh, corporate law and even more specifically the, cost, the company's constitutional documents. So, so the idea as I see it is your initial product or the MVP is is um, is something that allows founders to create companies very easily right and, and have these companies also recognized uh, in in the jurisdiction in the jurisdiction that they were created right but this sort of product gives you an entry way into slowly offering other services uh, to the founders and managers of the company this could be like voting governance accounting and uh, so slowly your kind of product stack expands into all of these other functions and you basically make money on sort of monthly licenses or monthly usage fees software as a service exactly okay all right so 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 tell us um tell us what's innovative about uh, the the way um you enable founders to incorporate companies or maybe even before why hasn't this problem been solved by some other company satisfactorily? Because it seems quite an obvious thing, right? I, I know, it's so obvious. But you must, uh, you must do a tour of some of these companies um, that do this business. The traditional incorporations agents of the world. You must actually visit the office to understand this problem. Um, and we visited one of them. Uh, when you walk in, uh, green carpet, uh, brass lamps, um, legal books in a bookshelf, 
And the most advanced thing in the entire place was still a CRT monitor. Mm -hmm. So this profession, as I mentioned earlier, is still one of the professions that nobody has attempted to automate, standardize, um, thus far. I think it's always been a big challenge. Why? Because you could standardize legal documents, but you still always need to go to a legal person for execution. Right? You cannot just standardize documents yourself, execute it yourself, enact it yourself. Um, and we weren't able to do this as well before until we have the ability to build smart contracts on an immutable database, mm -hmm. like the blockchain. Right? So now instead of you um, having to go to a lawyer and depend on processes that are at this law firm uh, to validate your contracts, you can deploy your own based on certain templates and the network bears witness to these contracts. So, uh, so in, in the crypto space, as you, as you know, there's this big debate that um, are, are, are smart contracts really useful or like what is the utility of smart contracts, right? Like, and, and there'll be these endless debates on Twitter about how smart contracts are essentially useless slash useful and so on. So like walk us through one process, like pick one process in company incorporation. Sure. Let's, let, let's say that without smart contracts, what it, what, what it is. And like with smart contract, what it can be or is through autonomous and why it is better. Like try, let's try to sell smart contracts technology. Uh, and, 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 and like, why is it important here at all? Sure. Um, so I will not use incorporation as an example. I'm going to use a specific corporate action that you do um, typically in a, in, a, in a private limited company, transferring of shares. So say if I were to transfer some shares from me to you, uh, what process do we need to follow? In the real world, uh, in common law jurisdictions like Singapore and Hong Kong, and the UK, uh, first, the both of us will need to sign a share transfer form. Basically me saying, I agree to transfer you X number of shares for a certain amount of money, and you saying you accept this transfer. Uh, after that has been done, uh, a board resolution that is signed by the directors of the company, and we might not be directors of the company, we could be, but we might not be directors of the company, uh, board resolution needs to be uh, deployed by the corporate secretary for the directors of the company to sign. And after this board resolution is signed, only then can the, trans the shares actually be, the share transfer can actually be enacted. Right? So in the real world, what does your corporate secretary do? She will tabulate or she will draft that share transfer form that both of us have to sign, make sure that's accurate. She will see us executing it. Um, after that, go to the directors of the company, give them the board resolution to sign. Again, make sure everything's pre-filled, so sign that, and then use that board resolution to file with the local regulators uh, the share transfer that's taken place between the two of us. In our process, so this is traditional, uh, traditional process flow, right? And you can already see with such a process flow, and, and again, this is not numbers I'm making up, it's told to us by our in-house corporate secretary. So we have, part of the team is a bunch of legal corporate secretaries, right? And they are the ones that do filing with the local regulators and make sure everything that we do is uh, compliant. Mm -hmm. Now, she tells me that in the old world, uh, with the traditional firms she used to work, she could manage at most 80 companies in a given year because the amount of due diligence that you actually have to do, the process that I just discovered, uh, this, I just described, which is a due diligence process, um, is intensive, right? So they can only handle maybe 80 clients a year. Now, with the way we've built the system, uh, what you do is maybe let me also uh, not talk about the identity aspect of it, which we can talk about later, but assuming you've got an identity creator on your platform already, you would log into the platform, you would initiate the share transfer. The share transfer itself would trigger a creation of a smart contract that contains the share transfer form as uh, data. And then it would say, okay, this share transfer is happening between Manu and Meyer, and therefore uh, the two of them have to be signatories on that, on that transfer form. And only the two of us will be able to sign this. And the moment we've signed it, I've got an automated corporate secretary bought a backend process, if you would, she recognizes that we've signed this and automatically deploys that second board resolution that I was just talking about with the same details that are contained in the share transfer form. So again, you eliminate another point of error where in the traditional world, you could have had the corporate secretary make a mistake in filling out that second form. Uh, but because we've automated this process flow, the second form just retrieves information from the first form. Um, and who has to sign the second form? That is where the, the need part comes in. So the second form, as I mentioned, has to be signed by directors of the company. And guess what? The directors of the company are reflected in the company smart contract. 
So your company smart contract is a giant legal, uh, a, a giant code version of your legal document, which says who the shareholders of the company are, who the directors of the company are, and so on. And what the signing conditions of these individuals are. So any all these all the stuff that is typically reflected in your company's constitutional documents are also reflected in the company smart contract. Such that when I deploy this board resolution, the board resolution asks the company smart contract and doesn't depend on any external source of information who the directors at that point are, and only those guys are able to sign that board resolution. Once that board resolution is signed, again the automated backend process will listen to this and file that completed uh, board resolution with uh, the company smart contract. So the company smart contract simply will not transfer shares from me to you without this valid board resolution. Without that, and that board resolution also has a dependency on the share transfer form. So without these two documents, that share transfer will not take place in the company smart contract. So at the end of the day, when the share transfer has happened, and you see this in the company smart contract, you can trace right down this entire process flow I just described to do your due diligence. That, that's very interesting. And we were, we were talking about this uh, before the show and talking about process digitization and uh, how we can, you know, use blockchain technologies to digitize processes. It, it you know, it, uh, it turns out that, you know, the, the company that I uh, co-founded Stratum is also doing something similar to this at a, perhaps at a, at a more abstract level, but it, it's very similar. And so this, this example really speaks to me um, because for every, Every step of this process of this share transfer process, you know, you're going to want to know who did what at what time in what order and for what reason, and those those are the five key questions. And you know what what you get with blockchain technologies, uh, I mean, broadly speaking, and you know, with Ethereum and especially the way that you've implemented it, uh, as far as as far as I can understand, is that you, you really get all you know you you can answer these five questions for every step of the process. Indeed. So you know, we we talked about. Uh, I think we mentioned KYC or AML. You know, so when you when you do a share transfer, I would I would guess that in most jurisdictions you're going to have to do some sort of KYC AML at some point on 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 the participants in that in that transfer. You're not just going to transfer to some you know anonymous party uh, overseas. Um, is is it possible to also do that process that that identity process within the autonomous platform is that something that you're applying, uh, where you're relying on third parties? Um, and how does the smart contract, if it's done by outside parties, how does the smart contract uh, get the proofs or uh, interpret the proofs um, from those trusted entities that would be doing, you know, verification of IDs and things like that? Very good question. Um, yeah. So before, when we first started building a platform, we quickly identified that okay. We want to digitize assets. Uh, the only way to digitize assets is to digitize the company's constitution. Great. Uh, but what's in the constitution? People. Um, so how do you digitize identities was the next question, right? And that is also why we have our own identity smart contract design. Uh, unfortunately, because we started building this uh, before Uport existed, uh, or at, at least Uport was there already at that time, but they did not have the specific features that we needed to build our platform. So in the end, we had to build our own identity solution. Um, so what, what, what happens now when I invite you, so in this process that I described earlier, let's say I'm about to transfer shares to a new shareholder, and I invite this new shareholder to the platform, a regular email invitation, that person logs in for the first time, they will need to deploy their persona smart contract. This is just an electronic version of you, and this is the smart contract that holds assets, that signs documents, um, and also is a holder for your identity information, of, of course, encrypted. So when you log into the dashboard for the first time, you, you deploy a persona smart contract. Again, on the front end, looks like a form that you fill out, first name, last name, all the required details that are, are required for each jurisdiction. So if you were in Singapore, you'll have a different form from if you're in, incorporating from Hong Kong. Uh, but even at that level, we've abstracted commonalities and... Uh, modularize it in such a manner that if you did deploy it for Singapore, you don't ever have to deploy it for Hong Kong and you might just need to augment the information that you've already previously entered um, that is extra for Hong Kong, for instance. And once you, uh, and we also show you your private key, or in our case, the 12 word mnemonic uh, seed. Uh, we show you that so that you can, and we instruct you to copy and paste it. The future will obviously be that is generated also 
um, via a mobile device, like your phone, for instance, and you never even get to see the private key and it simply just gets stored in your secure execution environment. But we're not there yet at Autonomous. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. Could, could one use a certificate that would have been issued by a certificate authority where that certificate authority you know, would have done KYC uh, prior to issuance? Uh, so that process in our system is not possible at the moment. So the way we've done it is you first deploy your identity and then we've got what you call certification authorities, we call them verification entities, intentionally to move away from some of this conventional lingo because um, in, our, in our context, you won't have just one certification authority. You could have multiple certification authorities for different purposes. So once you've deployed this persona smart contract, uh, what happens in the background literally is you have created, you've, we send a small amount of ether to your account because in the Ethereum world, before you can deploy a smart contract, you need ether, right? Uh, but this is a private network, so don't worry. It's, we're not spending a lot of money to do this. At some point, we'll go public, but not yet. Um, so we send a small amount of Ether to our account, and then we get the end user to deploy their Persona smart contract on this account. And then th that does, that's not the end of it, because you could have basically deployed a Persona smart contract, uh, calling yourself Mickey Mouse, if you would like, um, and down uploaded garbage, proof of address, and proof of identity documents, which we also require. Um, so you still need a, a person to check your identity smart contract or your persona smart contract. And that's where we have the concept of verification entities. Um, and we've got administrators who manage the register that this verification entity holds. And this register basically says, who are the validated identities under the autonomous platform? So that is when we log into the platform as administrators, we download your proof of address and your proof of identi uh, identity documents which by the way, the way we've implemented the encryption of that is also above and beyond what is traditionally done. Um, it's PGP style where it is shared to the people that you need to share it with. Um, so even if I didn't have SSL on my website, I still will not lose any sensitive information. The encryption is actually done client side. Brilliant. <laughs> we had this in proof of process as well. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, at the end of the day, everybody thinks that they came up with an identity solution, but essentially what I believe is if we all are doing it the right way, we're going to converge to one solution for identity. I don't think there's going to be much variation on that. There might be slight uh, nuances, but uh, the overall design should be the same. So we really didn't do anything interesting there. So um, uh, we, we saw that encrypted um, and even the key, right? So in the early days, a lot of people asked us, okay, so you're asking the end user to keep the key, but what if they lose it? What are you going to do then? Um, and we said, okay, we had, we were asked this question by a major financial institution and we're like, okay, we have to address this. We used to say, oh, too bad. Uh, but then later on we said, okay, you know what, we'll just apply Shamir's sharing algorithm and split your key three ways. And the three parts get encrypted, um, in the early days by three individuals. Uh, but we've quickly learned from that and realized you cannot trust your two other friends. <laughs> uh, so you need to have three entities. So at the moment, the way it works is. Uh, autonomous is one entity and two other law firms uh, would hold parts of your key. Two of these need to come together to recover your key and that's the only way uh, your key can get compromised if, or can get retrieved if you would. I'd like to stay on this on this idea that you know this, this stock transfer use case and you know, we can come back to the technology in a minute because there was a really interesting blog post uh, I'm not sure if it was you or perhaps the CEO uh, Hans uh, who wrote it talking about uh, value and so the idea this idea that today when we think of where where does value exist you know is it is it paper notes is it you know stocks or bonds um, you know, publicly traded stock but in in reality like there's a lot of value that's held in privately uh, in private companies that are not uh, where, where the stocks are not available for trade on open markets and um, you know, some there are some secondary markets, but for the most part, you know, if, if I think of uh, like, for instance, you know, my company, um, all that value is sort of stuck there, and the process of transferring value from one part participant to another, as as you've mentioned, is a very long, complex process. As I've learned recently through going through a funding round, uh, that you know, involves lawyers and and, and a lot of. Um, uh, sort of this digital, this medieval type of process. Um, what do you see as a potential? You know, where 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 do you see? So you know, if you if you think 15, 15 years ahead of time, can, can we envision a, a a a world in which one can 
trade private stocks you know, as you do with a private uh, with a uh, publicly traded company? Uh, is that a technology barrier today, or is that a regulatory barrier? It's a regulatory barrier, but we must understand before we lift that bar barrier, cross that barrier, or blur that line, why it exists. It exists for consumer protection, because for a pro uh, for a publicly listed company, there has been due diligence that's been done on that company, right? So that is why you know that this company is legit, you know that business is legit, the financials are legit, and therefore you can open them up for retail investors to take investment in. Uh, but for a private company, that's not the case. For a private company, there is no requirement for them to even, in some cases, have audited financials. So as an investor, when you go in today, you need to be somebody that's a creditor. You need to be somebody that understands the risks of investing in such a company. Um, how are we, So as much as I see that barrier, how are we sort of blurring that barrier? We're blurring it by automating the corporate governance, making the company a lot more transparent. Um, and yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Han loves to say that 80 or 85% of value in the world is held in private limited companies. But I say it's misheld. It's not held properly. Um, often what you realize that you, you, you look at a cap table and you see, oh, um, there's a missing shareholder or there was a share transfer not filed. Um, a whole bunch of uh, mistakes, right? Um, so that's the part that we need to prevent um, from being possible in that space. So the way we see it, and I, I, I presented a few times uh, where I use this one chart, uh, which talks about how we approach traditional systems design, uh, whether it's law, education, a banking system, uh, we design it in one way. We design the system in a way that it can be circumvented. We then design a policing framework uh, to police the people and then to police the system. And then we design a punishment framework to punish the deviants. And each, each part of this layer, each layer is additional cost, right? Um, and if we are in a paradigm right now where through the use of technology, through the use of innovative systems design, that we can finally design systems in such a way that cannot be circumventable to begin with, um, then yes, we can indeed unlock the value that is otherwise locked up in these private limited companies and narrow that uh, line, uh, blur that line between private limited companies and public listed companies such that the due diligence for both would be at the same level. We've also got another vision at Autonomous. At some point, uh, once we've done this corporate governance part via smart contracts, we're also going to do the accounting part via smart contracts. And once you've got corporate governance and accounting in a incorruptible fashion um, uh, in a systems design, then the last part is really, instead of you having to list this company in an exchange, why not put the exchange into the company? Mm -hmm. So what is an exchange? An exchange is just a fancy order book and order management features. You could put that order book and the order management features into the company smart contract. And again, that is also where you can blur that line between a private company and a public company. Now, I'm curious before we, maybe this is a good, uh, a good time to move on to the next topic that I had in mind, which was, uh, you know, regular regulation and you know, perhaps some of the frictions that you've experienced when dealing with regulators. It would seem to me, uh, you know, hearing this, if, if I'm a regulator, right. And, uh, I've got, um, I've got this company that's building this system where we can automate um, company governance and we can uh, automate share transfer and we can uh, reduce uh, the, the the possibility of errors with accounting and this sort of thing. As a regulator, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, this is great. I want to implement this. I want to work with this company. I want to build my processes and the regulation, my future regulation around this type of technology. What has your experience been in working with, or perhaps you know, discussing this with regulators uh, and lawmakers? And uh, uh, that is definitely not the experience. <laughs> that is definitely not the experience that I've had. Where they see this as, "Hey, great! This is gonna, this is gonna make my life a lot easier." Uh, but I think we also have to be realistic and understand who these regulators are. They are lawyers themselves. They are accountants themselves. I think at the end of the day, they probably are also a little bit worried that they might be disintermediating themselves. Right? They might um, disrupt themselves. Uh, so I think there is a little bit of that at the moment. Um, and they often are not technologists either. Right? Uh, but what's happening and what we start noticing is a lot of these senior appointments now, the, the old guards are starting to retire. You've got 
younger people joining the organization or these government entities. And these guys are a lot more tech savvy and they see the opportunities of moving towards blockchain. But thus far, we've, um, maybe with the exception of Dubai, where there seems to be strong, strong top-down um, pressure to innovate, um, in the, tradi in the traditional jurisdictions that we operate in, that's not necessarily the case just yet. Okay. And also because I think the whole blockchain world and uh, yeah, the whole blockchain world has still got a bit of a negative connotation to it as a result of the DAO and a bunch of other things that have happened before, right? Yeah, that, that's definitely the case. And, you know, I, I think uh, uh, you know, if we take a step back in a broader perspective, a lot of this, a lot of these, um, you know, proceedings and legal documents around sort of standard things like incorporation, share transfer, um, you know, raising funds. A lot of this stuff is is pretty standard, right? I mean, yeah. these are it templates, is. right? And they're, they're internationally recognized templates. You know, if we look at some, you know, a lot of these are, st are, are standardized, basically. And I think that it, I I know people. You know, if you look at, um, for instance, the research that Prima Verdi De Filippi is doing, you know, she she's looking at you know, how you can take um, these uh, processes and open source them in a way that they're made available for anyone to use, right? So in, in any case, you know, whether it's autonomous or open source com communities or whatever, like these things are going to get, you know, much, much simpler for people to, to use and to utilize uh, and to build software and build applications on. So, uh, you know, fighting that as a regulator, like... Yeah, as you said, you know, perhaps the younger generation coming in uh, has um, you know, much, much is, 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 is more open to that idea than the old guard. Indeed, indeed. One of the questions I, I, I've been having when I listen to you is in, in, in all of these cases, whenever you have these forms or these contracts, right? Like, are they like pure programs or how do these contracts exactly work in a way that they are also held up in court okay so let me give you a bit of background in terms of uh say this part of corporate law right this section of corporate law specific to corporate governance and private limited companies it's by nature already very standardized so there exists a whole bunch of forms that you can use uh best based on best practices over over time um, and you don't have to have a lawyer look through them at all and they're not customized uh, so if you look at the share transfer form i described earlier it has got certain essential features, number of shares, the type of shares, the, uh, how much you're paying for each share. That stuff is, you know, it's not, uh, it's just a variable in the smart contract and it's uh, completely abstractable. So that's, that's essentially what we've done is we've taken all these parameters from these legal documents. We've put them in the smart contract because those parameters need to be used, let's say in the share transfer function or any other function in the, in the company smart contract. Um, and left the rest of the legal lingo in there because they still need to be admissible in court. So this, this legal lingo exists as a PDF document that is hashed into the smart contract and that smart contract is a share transfer function I could use to move shares around. Something like Correct. that, Correct. Right? Exactly. So basically, um, when let's say I'm, I'm giving you some shares, uh, we are in a sense filling out a, a paper form, putting it as a PDF, and also calling this smart contract function that allows us to move that around. But yes, so you will see a conventional legal form on the, on, on the dashboard, mm -hmm. um, and you just type in the details. So you say number of shares, whatever. So you're filling in this legal form, and then you're signing the legal form. That's also essential, right? You must also, it's, I can't just show you a form that just has number of shares and uh, the amount that you're transferring. Uh, and that's it. I have to show you a legal document so that you're actively sort of filling this out for it to have legal validity. And then you use your 12 word secret phrase, um, your mnemonic seed to then create the smart contract, which then signs that smart contract as well. Um, and that resolution smart contract, as we call it, we can generate a PDF out of this. And when during your persona creation, what I left out earlier was you also put, upload your signature, your conventional signature. Either you use the scratch pad or you upload an image of your signature and that gets encrypted again by your public key. So you're the only one that's able to decrypt it. And then when you sign something, you decrypt it and paste it onto that document. So it still has that conventional signature along with a QR code 
and the QR code has got details of when the transaction hash of this transaction on the blockchain. So, for example, if I create a company autonomous, um, yes, with autonomous in Singapore, all of the um, smart contracts themselves are running on a private blockchain that is maintained by autonomous the company, right? Correct. And, and whenever, let's say, I'm doing a share transfer, uh, the form and the transaction that executes that share transfer also happens on that private blockchain, right? Correct. Tell us why you went for the private blockchain architecture. Uh, the private blockchain architecture only because that's my last form of defense. If something was not designed properly or if there was a problem with the system. Um, we need to get, because you can appreciate that this is a, a legal play, um, we need to make sure we get the platform vetted. We need to make sure the smart contracts are vetted. We've done internal audits several times. Uh, but that is not enough. We're looking for people who are able, uh, who are capable enough um, in not just the legal space, but also in terms of smart contracts and, 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 and software uh, to audit some of the stuff that we've done. And once we get, once we find such a person or an entity that can do this reliably, then, and we get it audited and everything is kosher, then we will absolutely deploy this in a public chain. But for the moment, the reason we don't is simply just that it, forms as a last line of defense, just in case if we are not encrypting documents correctly um, or if we're exposing some sensitive information somewhere, that that problem is mitigated. Sorry, sorry I, I may have missed something. What chain are you building this on? Ethereum. Okay. But, but, but it's a private, private Ethereum. Private chain. Oh, It's a private okay. Ethereum instance, yeah. I see. Okay. And I'm um, curious, why did you choose to use Ethereum and not some other, um, I don't know, I would say more robust, but uh, another type of uh, private chain system uh, such as uh, Hyperledger or Tendermint or something like that. Fabric didn't exist at that time. Tendermint didn't exist at that time. So actually, we, we only had Ethereum to work with, um, in all honesty. Um, what I had before was Color Coins, Color Party you mentioned. Uh, but to do that at that level was just as good as you rewriting Color Party with the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah. So with regards to the confidentiality and, and privacy considerations that are required for these types of operations, uh, is, is Ethereum, the public Ethereum network, going to provide uh, those, those features? Is that something that, that you've looked at? Um, they, they are. I mean, Ethereum is now building proof of uh, authority type of uh, framework. And yes, we can. Um, was that the question? I, I, are you talking about? Well, if you're doing a share transfer on the Ethereum network, uh, you know, that, that share transfer would be public. Uh, yep. How would you how would you consolidate the oh, privacy okay. confidentiality considerations there? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the only way you can identify a person on our platform is through their contract address, the persona contract address. And when you do when you do a get on the persona contract address, you will get an encrypted ID file. You cannot decrypt the ID file unless you are a member, a fellow member of the company or you are an administrator like Autonomous. So anybody that sees your trans the share transfer just sees that a set of hexadecimal numbers have transferred to another set of hexadecimal numbers. But they don't know who transferred to what and what company this is for and none of those other details. Uh, so the encryption is at the identity layer and not at the transaction layer. Okay. That's how we sort of preserve privacy. Have you have you looked into the uh, upcoming? Uh, it's called RGPD uh, in Europe. That the regulate basically like the privacy regulation. Um, the right to be forgotten. Well, that's part of it. That's part of the broader. I forgot the acronym. I know it in French, but uh, I, I I think perhaps even with the way you describe it, there may be some. You may have some friction there with with the regulation in Europe. The, the current way, as I understand it, even with the UK, we looked at this extensively. Um, in the event of some kind of litigation, a court process, or criminal investigation, we need to be able to present the information about the people that are concerned, right? Um, that's the obligation we have. And we are able to do that because, as I mentioned before, we, um, by, by default, when you encrypt your identity data, you share it with the autonomous verification entity. So that's the only entity that has that access to the information. Um, ideally, in, in, uh, in, in future, maybe we could further decentralize that and have some kind of a reputation-based identity uh, model. 
um, or a whole bunch of KYC oracles, which we also haven't seen. I don't know why people are not working on these things yet. So you've got Reuters World Check, you've got a whole bunch of service providers. Just build a KYC oracle to the service provider so that they will automatically stamp identities when they deploy on the blockchain. Haven't seen this happening yet, but that could also be one way you achieve automation and minimize the risk that I just mentioned. But at least for now, we still need to be in control or not in control, must have access to the identity data of um, our users. Okay. Uh, the regulation I was referring to is General Data Protection Regulation (GDPR) in, in English. Um, gotcha. Which which will be which will come into an effect in May of 2018, and. Uh, I, I know that f I'm not directly in contact with uh, the data protection officers of the companies that we work with, but um, one of the um, one of the fears or you know, some of the concerns with Ethereum, at least for the moment, with how the regulation is being interpreted and in the way that Ethereum is is built, is that perhaps there will be some incompatibilities with regards to confidentiality and data privacy and right to be forgotten, uh, even if the data is encrypted. Although I not entirely sure. Well, you're, you're, you're probably right. Um, you're probably right. I think what we have to do is not present this as a silver bullet solution, but present this in the context of how traditional systems design is done and then show that this is still better than traditional systems design. Um, and we, we all know what happens to companies like Target or Target. How do you, how do you pronounce it in the US? Target. With, yeah, Target. Um, and you know, you know what has happened to them several times now. Um, so that is traditional systems design for you, right? Um, oh no, I totally, I totally agree. <laughs> I, 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 uh, yeah, I totally agree. Traditional systems design and the way that we've been designing architecture systems architecture for the last 50 years, like it, it's not compatible with the world of today and the world of tomorrow. But will regulators bite? <laughs> regulators bite, you know. There will there will always be some friction there, um, but you know, in, in my in in our experience at least uh, the way that we look at it is we we really try to work with the regulator uh, and get them involved in a conversation very early on, justly so so that that so that we're working with them in order to build this the, the, this new architecture. I, I completely agree. Uh, we try to do that as well. Uh, but you can imagine how difficult that process is as well. Uh, whenever you go to them with a specific system design um, and wait for them to give you approval, you might be waiting for a long time um, and you might be, yeah, uh, you might not be solvent <laughs> while you're waiting. One, one key question I get is as an entrepreneur, um, if I, let's say, let's say I, I set up a private limited company today my uh, my sort of privacy exposure is to the government right now right like the, like the, the government sees sees my share registry they see who all my shareholders are uh, what sort of resolutions we have taken and things like that but in this autonomous architecture i feel that i'm not only exposed to the government but i'm also exposed to autonomous the company itself ah so because autonomous is a corporate secretarial service provider we our default, by default, a corporate secretary in all the companies that we incorporate, we, in the real world, we already have exposure to these companies. We see them. Um, so this is also, in, in Singapore, for instance, if you're not a licensed, so we had to get a license to be a corporate secretary or service provider, you are not able to act as a corporate secretary. Um, so you can imagine your corporate secretary knows everything about the company as well. So today, I would be exposed to my corporate secretary and, okay, the corporate secretary is being... Uh, uh, replace sort of by autonomous I'm exactly not, i'm not creating an extra party that i am exposing all my information to correct correct okay and on on your private blockchain when there are like multiple companies on that same blockchain then um, is any of my data exposed to the other companies that are on this on that same blockchain uh, yes, uh, what data is exposed? So your company's contract address, you might come to know about it, right? Um, so when you get the contract address, what can you do? You can say, uh, there are a few functions that you can run on it. Uh, but the, let's say the most sensitive function is get me ID file. And when it gets you ID file, it's again an encrypted file uh, that can only be decrypted by the members of that company. So that's what you're exposing. But when you say do a get cap table function, uh, from the company smart contract, 
you will get a table, a two-dimensional array that's got shareholders and the assets that they hold, but these are the hexadecimal representations. So the contract address of the shareholder, contract address of the assets. Um, so that can be considered sensitive information, uh, but so far our analysis is it's not yet, a, a, it's not a critical breach, right? This is a, what we would like to think of an acceptable risk. Um, in other words, the end component of the persona smart contract or the company smart contract in terms of identity, that's encrypted. But the transactions themselves are not. And this is also not something that we can solve at the application layer. This might be solved at the protocol layers at some point when they make encryption possible at the protocol layer. Um, but yeah, this is how we mitigate it so far. Okay, so so basically like when, when I'm creating a company using autonomous, um, I am exposing my not say my individual identities of the people who are running the company but the transaction structure yes. of what happened inside the company so for example in my company let's say there were two share transfers in march followed by three in june followed by five in september that kind of transactional structure is exposed to anyone any other company that has also set up using autonomous correct right? And, and like this is something that is different from the current system. In the current system, you, I'm, not ex, I'm not exposing that, that information to companies across the world that I don't know. So this is a, this is a trade-off that an entrepreneur is making in exchange for getting easy setup. Indeed. It is. Indeed. Um, but also must be mentioned that this is also another reason why we are so heavy in the common law jurisdictions. In the common law jurisdictions, there exist national registries that any person can go and query. So in Singapore, mm -hmm. you could pay $5 and you could figure out that I'm a director in a certain company, you could figure out that I own a certain amount of shares in the company. So it's mm -hmm. not necessarily private information. Uh, in fact, in the legal world, should you wish to make things private, you do that by, again, creative legal engineering, like you set up a nominee shareholdership structure, which is basically a contract between you and another person. Um, and you tell this other person that, hey, uh, please hold these shares on my behalf, but I do not want to appear in this company. So again, it's not a technology problem to solve this privacy matter. It's a legal problem to solve. Uh, in other words, if you, do, if you want uh, to be kept anonymous in the company, then have a legal structure that makes you anonymous and do not depend on the system uh, to make you anonymous, despite the fact that it does its best job of doing it. So we, we talked, I think, earlier before the show, uh, or no, I think actually earlier we were talking about op open sourcing um, sort of standardized contractual agreements uh, and just having sort of the parameters um, be configurable, right, for specific types of, for specific types of uh, um, use cases. So if I understand correctly, so your, your platform is, is built... Uh, is, is an interface to these smart contracts. Um, how, as a user you know, of your platform, uh, what have you put in place that would allow me to you know, check these smart contracts, make sure that everything in the back end is being done according to you know, what the contract, the legal contract describes, that there are no bugs in there? Um, is there any transparency? Are those contracts open source? You know, talk about that a bit. So uh, the contracts are not open source. Actually, no part of our code is really open source. Uh, the reason for us not to make things open source is not because uh, it's proprietary or IP. It's rather because um, it's still very early on. And I think we should recognize the fact that blockchain is still an experiment, despite the fact that it might be version one point something. Uh, smart contracts are an experiment. And the autonomous platform is another experiment. So we're a third layer experiment, if you would. Um, so before we release anything to the public, we just want to be prudent and make sure that um, we've done our best to verify that uh, everything's kosher. Um, so it's not that we don't want to make things open source, we do. In, in terms of verifying the contracts that are deployed on the blockchain, anytime, so this is the other thing, right? Unfortunately, a lot of our clients are not um, technologists, are not blockchain savvy even. Majority, huge majority of them are not. Uh, they simply care about the fact that we're able to offer this service a lot cheaper than the traditional incorporations agents because of the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, but for, for there are people who ask me this question, I tell them, 
um, feel free, I will invite you to our blockchain network. So I could whitelist your IP address. You just deploy the node uh, that uh, we give you. We did customize the node a little bit. Why? Because we had to remove the proof of work, the very inefficient proof of work mechanism. Um, so that's the only thing that has been done on, on, uh, on our customized node. Uh, we'll provide you, even if you don't believe us and you say, no, I want to make the same customizations myself, we will say, okay, this is the lines that we changed and when you change that, you should have the same ending hash for that node software as our node. So they should be able to connect and you can connect to our node network and pull the contracts for yourself and verify them for yourself. We will whitelist you happily. And so, so, okay, so I understand that. So you're, you're sort of still in this experimental phase, perhaps working with clients on, on POX and uh, not at a, you know, perhaps not at a production stage yet. And, but, but once you are, once you have reached maturity, yeah, and audited, then I suppose that, you know, your, your contracts would be made open source then. Absolutely. Uh, so someone can check the validity of those contracts. Interesting. And so what, so you mentioned you pulled out uh, uh, proof of uh, the proof of work algorithm. What uh, have you replaced it with? We didn't really pull it out. All we did was just make uh, the difficulty constant. Because I we're see. the ones that are running our, our, our network. Okay. So at this stage, there's one validator, and that's Correct. autonomous. Okay. Correct. And the idea is that when you move through the public Ethereum chain or, you know, uh, a, a consortium or perhaps a consortium network or, you know, depending on the use case, uh, then you would you would rely on the validation of you know, all the miners. Indeed. And hopefully the protocol is also developed to a point where end users are able to, as part of the application, when they deploy the application, also easily able to deploy a node for that application. I see. So once they're able to do that, absolutely, what you said is valid. And, and thank you for being transparent about the fact that you're in experiment mode. <laughs> because <laughs> a lot of times, uh, we, we talked about this before the show, a lot of times in this space, you just have people say, yeah, we're doing this and we're doing that. We've got all this great stuff. But you, know, you look under the hood and you realize that it's experiment mode. I, I think it, it really... Um, you know, to, to, to have that humility to be able to say that, look, you know, we're building this stuff, we're still working on it, it's, we're still working out the kinks, or we're still constructing the use case is, is, a, is a very honest position to have and is one that I, I try to have as much as possible too. First, it's an easy position to have also because remember, everything that we do on the platform is also backed up in the real world because we still have the signed documents, they look like signed documents, we have filed the, the corporate actions with local regulators, so that state is also exists. So if there was anything to happen with our platform tomorrow, we can always fall back to the real world. So we have that option, and that's also why it allows us to be frank about um, our state of implementation, if you would. As Autonomous is going for the private blockchain, right? Like, um, Did you consider anything apart from a blockchain to do this? So the reason I ask is there's always this uh, debate that says that correct. If you're if you're if you're having a centralized chain, right, like with one validator, then um, there would be many people that would say that a blockchain is actually useless in that case, and there's a whole stack of technologies that will be better than the blockchain some way or another. But so tell us like what kind of trade-offs you explored before picking the blockchain to make it completely private. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's a very valid point. We get asked this question multiple times. You're right, uh, but with one subtle difference, right? On a database, it's a lot easier for you to manipulate data than it is on a blockchain, right? So even if you are one validator, it's still a very involved process for you to be able to do that. And I can tell you none of my developers can even do this. Just as one mitigation, but that is not good enough. Um, the reason we do this on the blockchain is because we see this to be the future. We want to be poised to the point where, um, I don't know when this is going to happen, hopefully within the next five years, that governments, countries start deploying a countrywide network for their citizens, right? And when, if we are poised and we build the application in such a way, um, then hopefully when that happens for us, it will be a very simple switch and we won't need to do what we're doing now. What we're building now, as much as it can be done in a database, for us, it's about where this can go in the future. So, so your, your motivation force is you want to be sort of compatible with the latest blockchain standards in the expectations that there would be some form of countrywide or global consortium networks that you could migrate to. 
Indeed. Yeah, or eventually to a public chain as well, a public Ethereum chain. We would definitely love to move there. Um, it's just that we're not ready even from an application point of view because we again. Like you're saying that all of the contracts are actually backed up by paperwork that holds up in code, right? So even if on the public blockchain, there's a problem. Uh, the problem that I have, uh, that I'm worried about the public blockchain is not um, transaction related, is how we store sensitive data related. So if on the blockchain, if I'm storing any sense, on the public blockchain, I'm storing any sensitive data because we made a small mistake in the algorithm or had this a bug, um, then I do not want to deal with that kind of exposure just yet. Okay, so uh, before we wrap up, uh, tell us where uh, where you're at right now. What's the product roadmap looking like? Are you, are you raising funds? Have you raised funds? Uh, tell us a bit about where you are at right now with Autonomous. Sure. Uh, we're in the pre... Oh, we're going to start our Series A soon. Um, in terms of the product, uh, the product itself, we spoke, to, we spoke about incorporations and we spoke about corporate actions like share transfer, but we've really done a lot more than share transfer corporate actions, whether it's adding of a new director, adding of uh, resigning directors, removing secretaries, and so on. You could even execute any non-smart contract related legal corporate actions on our platform. So if you say, hey, um, I just need this... Uh, board resolution uh, for my meeting minutes, for instance, then you could just draft that yourself on the platform and just use the platform to sign it or use your persona smart contract to sign it. We also offer that. So in the end, what, what happens is your company smart contract becomes a central repository of all actions that have taken place with the company. Um, and you could get this information from the company smart contract. And then beyond that, what we've also done is build uh, an employee share option scheme uh, smart contract. Uh, so you can imagine in the real world what happens when you issue options to employees is first you need to have a master contract in place, which has got all the general terms. You've got the rule book, then you've got the uh, allotment or, or the allotment uh, letters, the grant letters to your employees, right? Then you say, okay, I've issued you this much um, uh, conditional, non-conditional options and so on. And on a monthly basis or after the guy's first year clip, assuming, uh, he exercises these options. He has to do that by way of paperwork, correct? Uh, but again, this is something that we've automated with, via our employee share option scheme smart contract. Uh, in the traditional world, an employee share option scheme also requires a committee, an independent committee, typically headed by the directors of the company and, say, a third-party lawyer. Um, and the idea behind the committee is to make sure that when you've been told that you get a certain number of options, that you actually get those shares in the end. Um, and the way we've designed the employee share option smart contract is has eradicated even that need for a committee. Because once it's done, it's done on the smart contract, there's no way of, for you to reverse it, right? Um, and so we've done that. Uh, we also did safes. So you also have safes, um, so simple agreement for future equity, uh, smart contract as well. And what this basically does, the cool feature here is it works together with our funding module. Uh, so even in the funding module, what we've done is we've automated the... Uh, board resolutions that go to start the funding module to the term sheet, the shareholder agreement, the share subscription agreement, that process flow, uh, right up to the last board resolutions that actually do the issuance of the new shares. And when that last board resolution triggers uh, the issuance of new shares, automatically safe holders that are part of the company smart contract get converted if the conditions match. Um, so again, we've eradicated all those extra steps that are typically needed. So that's the stage we're at now. Now, uh, before we talk about the future features, in the interim, we are also working on making the platform scalable. Um, as you can imagine, what started out as a POC is still very much a pilot. Um, it's not really a production level application. Uh, the initial idea was to get the business process right. And it's been proven that the business process is right. Now we're trying to build the scalability component into it by splitting the application into minor modules, uh, sub-applications, and so on. Um, in, together with that, we're also doing proof of concepts for other big financial institutions that want to do something similar to what we've done for the private company space. Um, so we also have that going on. And with that, the future um, looks like either we will do a big uh, proof of concept for one of these major financial institutions uh, while still building our, making our platform scalable, but beyond corporate actions, we also have the aim, the want to go and uh, disrupt the accounting process that exists today. 
Um, so everything from, I just came back from a business trip where I now have to collate a whole bunch of receipts, um, submit them to my accounting person who checks them a second time, and then they get submitted to the person that actually disperses the funds. Um, if we could re-engineer that process, again, smart contract driven so that you don't have to do accounting once a month and you do it as you go on a per transaction basis where all these three actors are involved. Um, then that gives you that second component of a, say, the finance component to your company smart contract. And then when these two are done, maybe we talk about that beautiful future where we narrow the line between IPO, a private company and an IPO by offering exchange features also in the company smart contract. But that's way beyond the future. Just on the, on the expense and accounting stuff, like where do I sign? Yeah, where, where do I sign? <laughs> I think that's probably the most arduous thing that any any employee that travels a little bit you know, has to do is doing expenses every month. So if you could if you could automate that, just like take a picture of the receipt that's just <laughs> done, that'd be great. You know, I, and I I think that what's what's really fascinating about this and that where where it just um, overlaps you know, with a lot of what we're doing at Stratum uh, is is the, the the auditability of all this, right? Because once you've created all these platform, you, you, once you've created this platform where in effect you're digitizing on the blockchain the entire process, you know, which is the life of your company, it becomes really easy for external auditors, regulators, uh, you know, any, or any this type of decision maker to look at this and you know when you, when you think of auditing you know you, you implement a process and then you like you said a while you throw a book at someone and then they look at see, they look to see if that process was done according to the way that the book was written uh, if if you build sort of the the process in accordance to the way that it's meant to be uh, executed you can audit in real time or even not even have to audit anymore because you know potentially those auditors those external auditors are building that process with you and are part of the validation nodes. Indeed, you should be auditing the system once and every time the system changes and not be auditing per transaction, which is what right. we do today. Right, exactly. Yeah, like you do with software. Excellent. Well, uh, Manu, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was really fascinating to talk to you. And I, and for our listeners, uh, <laughs> it's actually quite late. Uh, we... we uh, we uh, managed to, to uh, we, we had a, an opening for this week and then Mano agreed to do the show, although it is close to two o'clock in the morning in, in Singapore where you are. So thanks again uh, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And we're looking, really looking forward to seeing um, the developments in economy. Oh, thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you so much to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. We release episodes every Tuesday and you can find those just about anywhere you find you know, video or podcast. You can find us on YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, iTunes, or any podcasting platform. Uh, also, if you're interested in uh, supporting the show, you can do that by leaving us a tip and the tipping address is in the show description. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week. 